I would like to welcome Jeff Linsky from the University of Colorado and NIST in, in Boulder. So it's a joint institute, GILA, that he works in. And uh, he's an astrophysicist, but uh, with great interest uh, looking over to heliophysics. He got his degrees at uh, MIT and Harvard. And I know Jeff at least since 1995. Ooh, yeah. So, the, so I think at, at the uh, meeting in Boulder, the uh, Ayaga, so we met there. And then uh, you are the one of the few, you, was in Alarma, Rudi von Steiger, and myself, who have attended all three EC workshops on uh, the heliosphere in the interstellar medium, 1995, when EC started, 2008. The and first the, workshop. Yeah, the very first workshop. And, and the uh, most recent one in November 2021. And uh, our mutual interest is the uh, heliosphere in the local interstellar medium that we are tackling here with measurements on IBEX, with pickup ions, hopefully in the future, the IMAP. And he is looking at uh, the nearby interstellar medium in the light of the nearby stars, and we're trying to bring that together. So that said, Jeff, we're looking forward to hear this news, but that has disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. We'll live with it. Okay, thank you, Everhart. So I hope it doesn't interfere too much with your slides. Otherwise, and if it does, I'll make excuses. Okay, thank you for coming and suffering through too much technology, which always delays things. Okay, okay. what I'd like to do is talk about the interaction between the uh, astrophysics and heliophysics in particular between the local interstellar medium and heliophysics. And this interaction region is, shall we say, sparsely populated by scientists. Everybody's over in the astrophysics side, edge of the universe, you know, cosmology, all that. Interesting stuff, of course. Or heliophysics and not paying attention to what lies just on the outside. So this is now a talk of interface. And it's going to be a little bit interesting because we're now going through a period in which I think we're changing paradigms. In other words, what we thought in the past, which helped us really well in understanding data, now it's been con confronted by all kinds of issues. Now maybe we're heading off into a new paradigm. So that life is interesting. Okay. So let's march on. Let's see if we can get this to go. So how do we go forward and backward? Oh, here? Arrows, arrows, uh, paper paper down. Enter. That means the focus is not on the issue link on the slide. Then. Okay. Yeah. Click. Fine. I can click on the individual slides if that's that's required. Any like this one? No. There we go. We'll do it that way. Okay. Did that before. Since this is a little bit complicated, mm -hmm. and some of you may know, some of you may know certain aspects of this, some of you may not know. I'm going to give you a abstract, an outline of what we're going to cover, and then we'll cover it. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is explain why we need ultraviolet high resolution spectroscopy. Okay. Why this is the tool for understanding the local interstellar medium. That tool is, is unique. It's only from Hubble, in particular, only from one instrument on Hubble in the Space Telescope Image Spectrograph. And it's important for our understanding of the local interstellar medium, which has interactions with um, the galactic chemical evolution. The stars, stellar winds, supernovae, create heavy elements that pollute the interstellar medium that then lead to star formation and planet formation. So this is sort of the intermediate case of that. 
And we'll talk a little bit about astrospheres, analogy is analogous to heliosphere, and uh, exoplanet atmospheres, and even relates to habitability, although that's not today's discussion. Then we'll go on to the model we've been using for the last 25 years or so, what I call the multi cloud model, how we came into this model, what the data are. Uh, how, uh, what kind of physical properties we're deriving, uh, the concept of a cloud in the interstellar medium, um, and the nearby clouds and the sun's motion through these local clouds. And then we'll go on to problems. Why it is that this model, which explains an enormous amount of data beautifully, is not the final source, not the final solution. So we'll talk about problems, namely, Individual clouds have homogeneous properties, which we didn't expect. Um, there are eternal distribution of physical properties in these clouds. Uh, and then do questions like, do these clouds fill, entirely fill space or the intercloud medium? And then finally, we'll go on to future things, which I won't go into any detail, but one of the reasons I'm here is I'm working with Everhard on the question of, is there a pressure balance between the heliopause inside, outside, the pressure balance between the outer heliosphere and the local interstellar medium is the pressure balance between the local interstellar medium and uh, local bubble produced by supernovae. And is there a pressure balance between that bubble and the gravitational force of material above and below the black and planet? I think there is pressure balance, but it's a really important issue and it relates to the whole question of uh, ram pressure. Okay. So that's the kind of things that are coming next. So let's go back and talk about the multi cloud model. Okay, here's some beautiful data obtained with the SIS instrument on Hubble, spectral resolution of three kilometers a second in the ultraviolet lines of magnesium two, iron two, single ionized iron, and deuterium, deuterium laminella. Okay. So what we're looking at is we're observing a star. We see a stellar spectrum. Typically, these are relatively cool stars like the sun, so there will be emission lines. And then we see very narrow interstellar absorption superimposed against the stellar emission line. Okay? So what you're looking at here is just a small fraction of the stellar line. I mean, there's going to be extending way off in wings, and you see interstellar absorption, and typically what you see is a multi-component absorption situation, okay? It's not just a simple absorption line, but it's the superposition of one, two, three absorption features relatively closely together in velocity space. We often see spectral uh, absorption lines that are widely separated, tens or 20 kilometers a second separation. And here it's just a few kilometers a second. So we have to go in and do a multi-component fit to the line profile. Now this is um, relatively easily done for spectral lines of high, um, which high atomic weight. So from atoms or ions that are relatively high atomic weight, because then thermal broadening is not too important. And what you're seeing is separation of velocity components by just the velocities along the line of sight. Okay? On the other hand, when you look at hydrogen lyman alpha, you have an enormous problem because the center of the interstellar hydrogen line has optical depths of a million. And anybody who tries to separate out what's happening but through an optical depth of a million is crazy. But on the other hand, there's deuterium, which the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen is like two times 10 to the minus five. So the deuterium line is sort of an optically thin or just barely optically thick. So we look at the deuterium line, but deuterium has low mass. Therefore, thermal broadening is very important. And if you see three individual velocity components here in deuterium, they're all much wider. So you can't derive the kinematic structure along the line of sight from deuterium. You have to get it from a heavy element, magnesium, or in this case, iron, and then assume it's the same in hydrogen and deuterium. Okay, that's not a very difficult assumption. Okay, 
But now imagine what if we had only 10 kilometers a second spectral resolution? You'd never know there are three components. What if we had one kilometer a second spectral resolution? Then who knows? There may be individual structures that are totally obliterated at three kilometers a second. Okay? The fact of life is there's only one ultraviolet spectrometer out there in space that we can use, and that's Hubble. And there's nothing in the uh, pipeline of an approved mission. So nothing's going to happen after Hubble, which could die tomorrow, for the next 20 years. This is all we have. Okay, fine. So one final thing. Why do we observe line, spectral lines in the ultraviolet? Reason is very simple. The interstellar medium is very low density. Therefore, the populations of all states, electronic states of atoms and ions, are in the ground state. So the only transitions you can see are from the ground state to the first or second or third excited level. They're all in the ultraviolet. Okay. Mother nature has dictated that constraint. Okay. So we did mention that. Now, okay. 25 years ago, we started getting this uh, beautiful data out of Hubble. We said, okay, let's try to model it. Okay. So you start out in the modeling business, you start simple. You say, okay, what's the simplest way of explaining these data? So we came up with the concept of individual clouds. So the question, you wanna be able to describe the three-dimensional motion of interstellar gas when all you have is the velocity in the line of sight, the radial velocity. So you have one component, but you wanna solve for three. You think that's a challenge? So here's how you do it. Okay. So we look at uh, various stars, different sight lines. Wherever we look, we always see interstellar absorption, either one, two, three, four, as much as six components in the line of sight. We always see that. Okay. Now we ask what if there are velocities, interstellar velocities that we see? One side line, another side line, another side line, another side line that are reasonably well separated. Okay? Because then you're always measuring a radial velocity component. But if they're widely separated, you can solve for a velocity vector and see if that vector, that best fit vector, gives you radial velocity components for all these different lines of sight. Now that works if you have at least four side lines. You can do it with three, but now the question is, is errors. You want at least four sight lines that are consistent, give you consistent radio velocities within the spectral resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope is, you know, instrument, which is sort of like about two kilometers of sight. And uh, if we find that, in other words, many lines of sight with uh, well separated, they have velocity components consistent with the vector that we solve for within two kilometers a second, then we have a co-moving structure. Gas is all moving in one direction, and we can solve for the three-dimensional three components of the velocity vector, okay? We call that a cloud, for want of a better word. Okay, so the clouds that we find are located within the distance to the nearest star that shows that velocity component. We look at stars at different distances, but the closest one says the cloud must be closer than the closest star, okay? Which is typically a few parsecs, okay? We make the assumption that the, the gas in the cloud is co-moving, all moving like a solid body at a density of 0.1, right? A little bit iffy assumption, okay? And uh, we assume that the uh, uh, gas motions have a thermal component, which is Maxwellian. May not be true. Okay, we assume it's Maxwellian. Uh, there are no shocks or non-thermal velocities in the line of sight component. These are all assumptions that can be relaxed if you get enough data, right? We assume the clouds are contiguous. There's not a whole bunch of pieces on the sky that are the same cloud. It all has to be together. And uh, the cloud boundaries, the outer edges, are determined by the hydrogen column density in that line of sight, that gives you a distance scale, divided by the hydrogen number density. 
Okay. And then the question is, if there's gas in between these clouds, then it must be fully ionized hydrogen or else it would be a cloud. We would see it. So those are all the assumptions. So I have a question. Yeah. So is every cloud is referenced from a particular star? No, it's at least four stars. At least four stars. At least stars. Typically, or in the case of the local interstellar cloud is 62 stars, lines of stars. Not one star. One star would not give you three velocity components. So for all of all of those stars in the same cloud, we get the same uh, velocity profile. See, same we get the velocity. same radial velocity consistent with one vector. Okay. Yes, but look, radial velocities will be different because you're looking at different angles relative to the vector. Okay. So here's how we play the game. My longtime collaborator, Seth Redfield, came up with this beautiful diagram that explains everything simply. Okay, if you have one ion, magnesium two, for example, and one side line, all you can measure is the radial velocity and the column density. That's all you've got. If you have multiple ions in the same line of sight, then you can separate the two line broadening mechanisms, namely temperature and turbulence. Okay, so the line width is the sum of two components, a thermal component and a non-thermal component that we call turbulence. Okay, if you have multiple ions and multiple sight lines, now you can get the velocity vector. Okay, you can identify individual clouds, you can identify the kinematics of these clouds, and look for variations in the clouds. And then you can go begin to go towards evolution and interaction of these various uh, cloud components, which is the subject of this morning's discussion. Okay, so let's point out what you can do. We have 62 lines of sight, all of which go through what we call the local interstellar cloud. It's a vector, one vector, and looking out pretty much over about 40 or 45% of the sky is all velocity, radial velocity components consistent with one vector, which we call the local interstellar cloud. Now life is more complicated, but stick with that. Okay, so we have, uh, we came up with a three-dimensional model of the local interstellar cloud shown here. I'll try not to trip on the wire. It's basically an egg. Okay, in which the black line is the circumference or outer radius or whatever outer boundary of the local cloud in a plane parallel to the galactic plane. And uh, red is below and blue is above. Three parsecs drawing cuts through this A. Now, the reason it looks like a simple A is that this is a spherical harmonic representation. Whenever you do a call to spherical harmonics, things look spherical, right? They're smoothed out. I don't believe it's that simple. Okay? But that's the spherical harmonic representation. But notice, zero, zero in this coordinate system is the sun. This is us. Galactic center is to the right. Galactic east is up. And we're looking down on the galactic plane from the north galactic pole. We always look down for the north, right? Because you live in the north. Okay, we're right at the edge. Are we inside? Are we outside? Are we in a transition region between the inside and the outside? Okay, good question. We asked that question 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We now can begin to answer it. Okay, so that's the local interstellar cloud. But there are some complications. We have a vector that fits radial velocities for all 62 components. We have a mean temperature and a mean direction of that vector. Okay, there's material flowing into the heliosphere, which we typically measure in neutral helium. Neutral helium doesn't react very, very well with, with ions and neutrals in the uh, heliosphere. Notice the pond helium, heliosphere. Okay, um, so, uh, and that is, uh, that material is coming in at a slightly different angle 
two or three degrees relative to the vector of the local cloud, and at a slightly different speed relative to the speed of that vector. Something slightly off, not big, slightly off. Okay. Now, so may I ask, what's the relative velocity vector between the cloud and the so the amplitude is like, I think, two and a half to three kilometers a second. Well, you know, it's real. No, you're asking for the the speed relative to the sun. Right. Yeah. That's 25. Well, the sun is moving through the local interstellar medium at 26 kilometers a second. Yeah. Yes, yeah, almost 26. Yeah. Okay. So we're barreling into it. Hmm? The direction we're barreling into this cloud. No, no, no. barreling out of the cloud. We're barreling out of the cloud. Okay, so let's. That's a good question. Let's show it. Okay, so we have all these lines of sight. We can identify fifteen clouds. Each have their own velocity vector and their own mean temperature. Uh, there looks like their own properties. And here's a layout of the clouds nearby space out to about six parsecs. Of course, a parsec is 200,000 um, astronomical units. Okay, individual cloud, there's the local interstellar cloud. We're right at the edge. We're headed into the G cloud, G for galactic center cloud. And there's all kinds of other clouds around there. Now, what's really happening? Again, within this set of assumptions of individual clouds that are moving, co-moving each in their own way. Okay, so we've got all these clouds, each one has their own vector, okay? So they're all moving with respect to the local standard of rest. Local standard of rest is sort of the mean flow of this piece of the galaxy determined by looking at stars in all directions, okay? So we have a sort of a mean flow, and then the clouds have their you know, individual flows relative to the mean. Okay? So, let's look at that. So, here's a movie showing three of these clouds and the heliosphere as a function of time. And we'll show it several times here. So, starting at 150,000 years ago, the heliosphere moved through the Raiji cloud, entered the local interstellar cloud at about 60,000 years ago, leaving it today and heading off into the next cloud. Okay. And that doesn't show the G cloud. It doesn't show the G. Yeah. I was discussing that with uh, um, Seth. Seth yesterday. We're going to modify that to the G cloud. But it does give you an idea that individual clouds are moving with respect to each other. We're moving with respect to them. And this diagram is valid if the local number density of neutral hydrogen is the same as what you would infer from the inflow of neutral helium into the heliosphere. This is the density of 0.2 for cubic centimeters. If the density is different, these clouds get either bigger or smaller. But at that density, assume density of 0.2 for cubic centimeters, notice the material between the clouds, which is highly ionized hydrogen, whether it's hot or warm, it's irrelevant in this, this argument. We have intercloud medium. So the heliosphere is morphing to partially ionized clouds into totally ionized region, back into clouds and so on, on time scales of tens of thousands of years, okay? And uh, the size of the heliosphere, of course, has to respond to the external pressure. So the pressure is larger, the heliosphere shrinks, but smaller it expands. And an extreme case, which I'll show here, of, uh, okay, here's today's sun termination shock, uh, uh, heliopause, uh, outer heliosphere, maybe a bow shock, whatever, and material from the interstellar medium coming in because the sun is moving through the interstellar medium at a density of 0.2. If we go to a region of much higher density, all of a sudden the heliosphere shrinks to the size of the solar system, you know, like 10, 20 astronomical units. Okay. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it has happened in the past. So that will correspond to from the previous plot, the region between the two. Well, the region between the two clouds 
is much lower density. You're right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Much lower density, but not much higher. This is 10 per cubic so centimeter, yeah. which is a factor of almost 100 greater than today. Okay. But the sun almost certainly went through regions like this in the past. And that would have affected the Earth's climate because all of a sudden the interstellar medium gas would come down to the Earth. It's not shielded by the heliosphere. Okay, so now that was all well and good. And now the re and, uh, but now we look more carefully, get a lot more data, and all of a sudden there's the issues. Okay. Let me go through five different issues. Say they have to be more complicated. First, it was really introduced by Cecil Gree and Ed Jenkins, paper 2014. And they said, you know, the interstellar medium can't be all these rigid clouds, and that's the internal motions. So let's go to the other extreme and say everything within a few parsecs of the sun is only one cloud with an internal velocity structure instead of many clouds, each with their own rigid structure, right? Two extremes, okay? So I said, fine. And then they uh, plot uh, essentially the measured radial velocity versus the mean value in their one cloud model. And they say, oh yeah, this sort of fits pretty good. And, uh, and it turns out in the direction in which the motion of the, uh, our motion of the sun through the interstellar medium is, is looks like a little higher velocity in the backwards direction or lower velocity. And that was their model. And then we said, okay, we're scientists. We have to do a controlled experiment. Which of these two extreme models makes sense or, there, or are we in between? Okay. Now, how do you do a controlled experiment in astrophysics? Okay. And the way in which it turns out we could do it is that after they published their model, data started coming in from a quote SNAP program. Okay, so let's, let's tell you a bit about a SNAP program. The way Hubble operates is there's all you, you proposed scientific programs. Many of them, most of them are multi orbit type programs, they're big programs. And every once in a while, there's a gap. Namely, a telescope is pointed over here, and the next program is over there, and it takes an orbit or two to move. But in the meantime, why don't we look at something in between? So what they say is, okay, you can propose a SNAP program of one orbit observations. Keep it simple. Propose a huge number, propose a hundred and the telescope operator will select the, the actual observation based on where Hubble is at that point and where they're moving to next and whether the target is in between. So now you have a program in which the proposer has not selected the targets. You select a random huge number of targets. The telescope scheduler has selected the targets, right? Makes it a little bit cleaner. Okay, so we have a SNAP program, 34 new targets, all selected by the telescope schedulers, not us, okay? Published in this paper by a student of Seth Redfield, Craig Melodet, 2014, who said, okay, let's take the two models, the 15 component rigid model, each one rigid, and the one component model with the velocity structure inside the model and say, okay, how well do they fit this new data that came out after the two models were proposed? Okay, and the answer is, there's a lot of the observed minus the model for the uh, Green Jenkins 2014 paper and the uh, uh, Redfield Liskey 2008 paper and uh, as a function of galactic longitude, galactic latitude, and here's the RMS root mean square, 2.1, 1.4, this model looks better. However, this model has many more free parameters, okay? You have more free parameters, of course you can fit the data better. Am I right? Okay, so it's inconclusive at this point. Okay, 
Let's march on. Um, okay. Second challenge. Do these clouds all have, each one have its own mean temperature and mean density and mean turbulence? Or is there a wide range of values? We assume everything was mean and maybe slight variations about the mean. Okay. So we now have a much larger set of sight lines, 97 of them, for stars located within 100 parsecs. And we've written this up in this AJ paper. Okay. So what we do is we look at the individual velocity components that are seen by these interstellar absorption components. And you, of course, have to solve for the temperature and the turbulence. So for example, well, here's an example of one component, stars HD 13.6, radial velocity 11 kilometers a second. And what we see is the uh, data uh, in terms of deuterium and magnesium. So atomic mass two, so it really measures thermal, and atomic mass, well, 16, what's magnesium? C is so that's more turbulent. Okay. So then you now do a plot and say, okay, the uh, uh, one one direction turbulence, all the direction temperature, you can fit a given line shape by a curve, which is mostly perpendicular for the light mass ion or element in this case, and roughly horizontal for the heavier mass ion, right? And where they cross is the right answer, right? So that's looking at this way, and here's a plot of the Doppler parameter versus atomic mass, ah, 26, okay? And, uh, and those, you have two data points, you fit a curve to it, and you get a temperature with an uncertainty and a turbulence with an uncertainty, okay? And you can do it for lots of lines of sight. It turns out, given the spectral resolution of Hubble, you end up with significant errors, right? For example, temperature, in this case, 7890 plus or minus 1100. Okay, so you'd like to have a plus or minus 100? We don't have that data. Okay, so we have a number of lines of sight. Now the question is, what's the distribution of temperatures through the local interstellar cloud, which is 62 or 36, we have 36 lines of sight for this, and all of the data put together. Now, what you see is you take the temperatures you measure and bin them every thousand degrees Kelvin, and you see a distribution. And just for the fun of it, I plotted a Gaussian. It doesn't have to be a Gaussian. The Gaussian sort of says a random distribution. Now what you see is what looks like a random distribution, maybe a few extras over at 12 or 1300 um, degrees, uh, 1000 degrees Kelvin, and a mean value. And the same thing with turbulence, a wide distribution of values. So these clouds are not homogeneous. Each one is not homogeneous. Wide distribution. And life is more interesting. So here's a plot. Now, for the take sight lines only to the local cloud and ask the question, we're going to take pairs of sight lines, all possible pairs of sight lines, of which there were 596, you know, exclude those in which, you know, star A and star B, and then compare star B and star A, so that's doubling the number, we eliminate those. Okay, and that's through the plot of the temperature difference between those two different stars and in different pairs of sight lines, uh, and uh, as a function of angular separation in degrees, and uh, plotting the red line is the um, mean error of temperature measurements. So we see significant numbers of differences well beyond the uh, um, measurement errors. So let's look at this in a different way. So here's plotting essentially the same data and now bend every 10 degrees in angular separation. That's blue line data. The red is the uh, uh, typical measurement errors. And yeah, there are significant temperature variations as you go from even the closest pair to the widest separation pair. Okay. So now let's ask the following question. Let's go to the closest pair way down here. Okay. 
Turns out the closest pair sight lines is sight line to the star Procyon and the star YZ CMR. Okay, YZ CMR is a flare star, by the way. Okay, there are two nearby stars. And uh, they're separated by 2.2 degrees angular separation. And the temperature difference is 2200 degrees plus or minus the measurement errors, which is about 700. And then we have a whole bunch of uh, pairs slightly larger than that 2.2, which give you similar results. Now, this is interesting. So if you're seeing two sightline pairs going through the local cloud, and they're both relatively nearby stars, then we can ask, okay, what halfway through the low cloud, what's their linear separation of the sight lines? Okay, sight lines separated by 2.2. And we're going to take a separation of that. And that's about 5,100 astronomical units. So, in other words, it looks like there's temperature variations in the local interstellar cloud of closer than. 5,000 astronomical units. And the heliosphere is only 200, 300, depending on how you're going to define the outer boundary of it. So it's not all that much bigger than the heliosphere. And the heliosphere is moving through this. So the heliosphere in time will see these conditions. And then you can say, okay, how fast is the uh, heliosphere moving through the local interstellar medium? And the answer is just turns out to be 5.1 astronomical units per year. So the heliosphere will see variations, at least in temperature, presumably also density, in less than a thousand years. Okay. Interesting. After wait a thousand years, we we'll see what's happening. Okay. But then the question is are we really measuring temperature? We're measuring what we call thermal broadening, but is that really temperature? It could turn out, oh, before we get to that. We looked at uh, how the uh, you know temperature and turbulent velocities vary with respect to every parameter we could come up with. Okay, galactic coordinates, distance to the sight lines of the stars, direction of the incoming interstellar flow, magnetic field direction, the angle from a strong extreme light of a source, namely epsilon CMA, angle with respect to the lick, uh, and it's a function of neutral hydrogen column density. No significant variation. Zero noise. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go to this. Okay, so is the quote thermal broadening really thermal or is that something else? So we make the following argument deuterium, low mass. Magnesium ion high mass. Okay. So thermal broadening goes as one over the square root of the mass, and turbulent broadening is independent of mass. Right? Okay. The abundance of deuterium and magnesium are relatively simple. So, so it's not a big saturation effect, like one line is saturated, the other isn't, so that will bias the results. Okay. So the plasma could include a superthermal component, right? Could. And if it had a superthermal component, it would broaden the light, the relatively light element deuterium, much more than it would broaden the heavier element magnesium, because these lines are primarily broadened by turbulence, not thermal. Okay? So what we need to look at. We haven't really done that yet. Is to look to see if that, um, you know, the, the difference in what we call temperature is really a difference in superthermal velocity percentage of that velocity distribution. We don't know that. To be you. Okay. Next, that was another another challenge. What is the density of these clouds? We have assumed up until very recently 
that, well, of course the density is the same, I was talking about neutral hydrogen density, is going to be the same as the density of neutral helium flowing into the heliosphere and then convert by the ratio of uh, helium to hydrogen. All right, 10 to 1. Okay, that density is 0.2 per cubic centimeter, neutral hydrogen. Fine. So now we've got a lot of data to play with. Let's look at this more deeply. Let's say, okay, we're here. There's a star over here. Is what if the line of sight were completely filled by a cloud? Okay, we have the neutral hydrogen column density, right? And then divide it by 0.2, and assume neutral hydrogen density, and ask, well, how far along the line of sight does that cloud extend? Does it go all the way or just partially? Without asking the question of where the cloud is located along the line of sight, so close in or further away, that's another question. Okay, so then we come up with what I call filling factors. We have 37 lines of sight for which we have good data. We can say, okay, what if the density is 0.2? What fraction, what we call it a filling fraction, does the cloud have in that line of sight? Guess what? They're all well below 0.2 if they completely fill the line of sight, with only one exception, AD Leo. We'll come back to AD Leo. Interesting target, interesting site. Okay. And this is plotting the filling factor as a function of distance from the sun out to where we think the where the star is located. Okay. And for the nearby region, not to say four parsecs, the average value is about filling factor is about 0.5 that corresponds to a density of 0.1 per cubic centimeter. Not 0.2. So this say, okay. And as you go further away, it goes down. Okay, there's two possible explanations. Either the clouds are density of 0.2 and they all half fill the line of sight to all of these stars, possibility number one, or possibility number two is the density is 0.1 and that completely fills the line of sight. Which of those two is correct? Okay. We can answer that question. You'll notice over here, four stars, red dots. They're all new arrived. They're all within par four parsecs. Some of them you may know, Epsilon Airy, famous star, has planets around it. Could be, a, could be an interesting um, place to look for existence of uh, living species. Okay, but that's not today's question. So we have four stars that all have the following properties. They're all nearby, then four, four parsecs. They all only show absorption of the local interstellar cloud. Nothing else, just local interstellar cloud. Local and the other thing is all of them have astrospheres. Now, astrospheres is the stellar analog of a heliosphere. And the way we see it is neutral hydrogen comes in. It charge exchanges with protons, giving you extra absorption of this incoming hydrogen, which in fact is slowed down by virtue of interaction with the protons. Slowed down, heated, you know, decelerated. Okay. So when we look in the interstellar line at the Lyman alpha line from the star, we see interstellar absorption. And to the right, the shorter wavelengths, we see a longer wavelength star to the red, we see an extra absorption feature. That's at the hot, the star is sitting in the region where there's neutral hydrogen. So all four stars sit in a region of neutral hydrogen. So that neutral hydrogen exists at the star, it exists where we are, and we only see local interstellar and cloud in between. So the only sensible explanation is neutral hydrogen from the local cloud entirely fills the final site. If so, the density is 0.1. Okay, that has a lot of implications that we're not expecting in the uh, uh, in what's been done in the past. Okay, first ex first explanation, a uh, first idea. Let me go back. 
see if I can easily go back here. I think it works now. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's go back to this picture. This picture is based on the assumption that neutral hydrogen density is 0.2. If it's 0.1, all these clouds are twice as big. Ah, twice as big. What happens? All these clouds now overlap. Okay, they all over, and now we're going to overlap. And the intercloud medium doesn't exist. Okay, so now let's go back to where we were. Uh, I haven't gone that far yet. Uh, can I find where we're? Oh, we're getting there. I'm sure, yes. Okay. So we're now thinking that the paradigm is shifting from isolated clouds separated by interstellar medium to at least within four parsecs, clouds uh, essentially overlapping each other, completely filling space with no, um, no intercloud medium in between. Okay, so now let's look at one of our favorite lines of sight. What's the nearest star? Alpha, Alpha Centauri. C. Alpha Centauri. Well, C, of course, yeah. yeah. And uh, but I'm, let's talk about the primary component, Alpha Cent A and B. Okay? That way so, you can get UV. Really? That way you can get UV. That's right. They're nearby. Okay, so here's um, for alpha cent A and for alpha cent B. What's plotted here is in the middle of the magnesium to Bergeron magnesium two line. We're looking at just the very core of it. We see interstellar absorption, single component, right, in all three lines, centered at about minus, oh, 17 kilometers a second. Okay, same thing with alpha cent B, right? One component separated about minus 17. Okay, blue line here is the predicted velocity of the local interstellar cloud. It's over here at about minus 15, you know, several kilometers a second to the red. Okay, there's no obvious absorption that we can find any of these lines from the local interstellar cloud. So we can establish an upper limit. Take the upper limit of that column density in magnesium 2 converted to hydrogen. We know the speed of the sun in that direction. We can say, ah, the sun will leave the local cloud in less than 2,000 years. There's so little material going aside. Or there's something different. Okay, let's proceed. Go next. Okay. All right. Colleague, Pavel Swatsina. I have to learn Polish. Okay. He did the following creative guy. He said, look, let's plot here galactic longitude, galactic latitude, and temperature as a function of the speed, okay, and different velocity. We do it as velocity. Here's the local interstellar cloud mean value for the local cluster. Same mean value for the G cloud, and the material coming in is different. Lack of latitude, G cloud, lack, that's what we're seeing in the intermediate region. And the same thing for temperature. So he's arguing that what's really happening, let's do this. What's really happening is the lack and the G cloud are essentially overlapping, it's an overlap region. Uh, you know, their velocity through space are slightly different, so there's an overlap region in which there's mean properties between the G cloud and the leg. We're looking through a mixed cloud, <coughs> intermediate cloud region. And then, and this is the brilliant part, he says, okay, what about the star Alpha uh, AD Leo? Remember, AD Leo is the one that was way above all the other stars in terms of density. That looked like a density of 0 0.2. Well, AD Leo, here's the sun, and you're looking along this almost linear region towards the star. 
So what you're seeing is the intermediate material, as opposed to other stars where you're looking this way or that way, you're looking through very little of the intercloud medium. And there's some other stars that do the same thing. I consider that really interesting. Yes. I'm sorry, the density of Leo was 80.2. That was assuming that the, the just from it, us to the point two completely fills the line of sight. And that's five parts. Okay. okay. And, and the additional thing is when you measure locally the density. So that was also part of the yeah. enough. Well, the the density coming into the sun you get point two. You get point two. Yeah. In other words, we're not in the local cloud. We're not in the G cloud either. We're in this little bit of an overlap region. Okay. Ah, let's march on. So, when you go back to this idea of 15, here's some of them individual clouds, there's the sun right at the interaction uh, region where the two clouds come together. You now, make all these clouds bigger. Maybe it's not a factor of two, but some factor bigger. And guess what? The whole region is filled up. With clouds and there's no inter and there's no intercloud medium and there's cloud overlaps. Okay. Now we have observed, you know, several hundred lines of sight, and a number of them have uh, cannot be explained, or the radial velocities and their locations on the sky cannot be explained by any of the 15 clouds that we've identified. They are, you know, unaccountable. Okay. What we're trying to explore just started yesterday. Trying to explore as well, are these really produced in the overlap regions where these clouds you know, overlap and with intermediate properties? And then the question is, well, what's the time scale for thermal equilibrium? Okay, good question. We discussed this morning. That's yeah, an action yeah, item, yeah. right? Okay, then. Another question is, are there shocks out there? You know, the last supernova nearby was two, two million years ago. There's probably some shocks out there. So here's a plot that uh, Seth Redfield made a number of years ago, in which he compared for any all lines of sight for which there's at least two clouds in the line of sight. Now, of course, they may not be in contact with each other, but he just plots the velocity difference. There are all kinds of regions here where the velocity difference is green or even yellow or almost red, large numbers, okay? Anything to the right of about eight kilometers a second is the shock if the clouds actually are interact with each other. If they're not interacting with each other, then who cares? No shock. Okay, so... so uh, when you say shock in this case, uh, do you talk about the thermal shock or do you include? Uh, I assume it's an NHD shock. Okay. Yeah. I assume it's an NHD shock. Yeah. But uh, so in our neighborhood, basically, that uh, velocity would be close to the motion of the, the heliosphere to 25 kilometers. Okay. I'm running out of time. So let me just one other thing. Okay, so why am I here? Okay, one major reason is Eberhard and I are discussing a paper that we hope to be submitted soon, but I'm not about to talk about it in any great detail. We'll see you. We're in full agreement and we'll talk about it. Okay, uh -huh. the question is what is there any kind of pressure balance between all these different pieces of the local interstellar medium? But of course, pressure balance involves total pressure. Okay, so you have to have uh, total pressure, which involves uh, uh, essentially uh, thermal pressure, turbulent pressure, magnetic pressure, ram pressure, galactic cosmic ray pressure, um, etc. Every kind of you know super thermal component pressure. Right. <clears throat> Put them all together. Okay, and then ask the question. Is the helio sheet, the material just on, inside of the heliopause, in pressure balance with the material just outside of the heliopause? And if they're not in pressure balance, then things are going to move, right? F equals MA, right? Is there pressure balance between the outer heliosphere and the local interstellar cloud or this mixed 
cloud region is the pressure balance between the local clouds and the um, bubble, local bubble, bubble produced by supernovae, whether it's hot or warm, whatever. And it's the pressure balance between all of them and the amount, the pressure of the weight of, of interstellar material perpendicular to the galactic plane that's sort of pushing down on us. Okay. And uh, and by the way, that number is like 22,000 and 20 minutes. Okay. The answer is probably yes. But we're not definite yet. In any case, if there are imbalances, two things. There are imbalances, of course, there are flows. There has to be flows. F equals MA. And if they're imbalanced, then you have to look at all the different pressure terms. And it turns out that ram pressure, dynamic pressure, is really important. Okay. So let me end there. It's three o'clock and say, are there any questions? Thoughts, advice, writing. Is there no, 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 no. So, so, uh, if there are any questions? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The plot that was showing the various local of the the clouds. Yeah. Was it? Were they? So they were all scaled by the same factor? Yes. Whoa. Yes, same factor. Either point. What the plot shows is point two is the scaling factor of the local in, local neutral hydrogen density, right? But if we scale it by point one, then it'll, everything gets bigger. But who says everything's going to have the same neutral hydrogen density? I don't believe that. Right. But we don't have enough data to answer that question, right? Stay tuned. But that there are some question on lines too, but maybe the uh, first conversion. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I'm just kind of familiar with the error, but I have a, like, a still a question. When talking about the cloud, is there any like aging effect? I mean, that if the star is quite far away from the cloud, then the lights need a long time to transport from the star. Okay, so, so the cloud wave is what, 500 astronomical units approximately? What number would you like? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere well, between 300 and 300. Okay. And whether it's a bow wave or a bow shock it is still not determined. Okay. So then the question is, you know, how long does it take for, for example, the solar wind to get out there or any kind of disturbance to make it out that far? Well, it's not like a straightforward equation, uh, calculation. From what? 1,000 kilometers a second? 500 kilometers a second, some number, and then see how long it takes to get out there. But yeah, we'd expect to see a solar cycle like that, but, but it may be delayed many years relative, you know, to some kind of variation, but it may be delayed just because the time it takes to get out there. And one final question, maybe, or, yeah, okay. Well, I don't know, the question is thought. Okay. Looking at all of this reminds me of Fermi's old theory about converging and bouncing clouds and cosmic ray acceleration. Yeah. First order Fermi acceleration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But the, uh, you have to have multiple clouds for that. Yes. Well, let me take on one. Because that's interesting. Yeah. Well, there's okay. a magnetic field. Yeah. Which turbulence is scattered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, this thing tends to run away. Stop. Okay. What I didn't mention is these stars one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Those are the locations of quasars, bright quasars that are sufficiently far away that they're point sources, okay? So we're all familiar with, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, scintillation in the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, that's because the Earth's atmosphere, you have a point source out there, star, and uh, there's variations in the index of refraction in the ionosphere that changes on a time scale of a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second, right, to get scintillations. Okay, turns out, the, the, for that, those five lines of sight, people have looked 
right, with radio telescopes. And they find the following interesting phenomenon. Namely, a radio telescope on one side of the Earth, one side or the other side, let's say 10,000 kilometers apart. And you see the same uh, variations, but a five minute change. Everything up, down, up, down, five minutes later, exactly the same patterns. In other words, there's a diffraction pattern that the Earth is moving through. Well, it turns out those lines of sight, those five, correspond to right at the edges of individual clouds. The clouds are interacting in some way. And the edges of the clouds, remember, we're in a region of um, far UV and extreme ultraviolet radiation. So the edges of the clouds are probably more ionized than the cores. Okay, you have edges of the clouds, a little bit more ionized, and the radio radiation is uh, essentially being propagated by the electrons. Okay, it's electrons through space that are basically changing things. So we're seeing the, I think, the edges of the individual clouds producing a diffraction pattern that the Earth moves through as it goes around the sun. And then a year later, you have a repeat of the same pattern. So the Earth is moving faster than these individual clouds are in there. But if you're really interested, I wrote a paper on this in 2008. Please read it. You'll find it interesting. Interstellar simulation. Okay, so twinkle, now, twinkle, little galaxy. Yeah. Okay, so that's not, not so little black hole. Excuse me? Not so little black hole. Either. Right. Yeah. Okay, so now let's hear Eric first. Uh, Eric, yes, question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was interested in particular with uh, with uh, um, uh, things that might account for discrepancies between the uh, you know, what, what you observe for cloud velocities and what you observe for inflow. And I thought of a couple of things that might do it. One would be if there's any kind of processing of the material as it comes across the heliopause, similar to what would happen at the Earth's magnetopause. And second, that uh, if you've got clouds overlapping, then uh, and I have no idea if the densities are high enough, but they, if they are, you would get drag between them. And I would expect that to have an effect too. We have drag if the time scale is long enough. Remember, the, the, the density is so low that the time scale for collisional interactions is very large. So you have to have to something of proper material was out there for longer than that time scale. Okay. No. Have I confused you? Have I confused myself? <clears throat> it was a two part question. What was the first part? The uh, first part was about uh, whether you might get uh, processing a material as it comes across the heliopause, much as you see uh, material being processed as it comes across the Earth's magnetopause. Okay, well, the answer is may well be yes. You know, for example, there is the quote slow breeze, namely, there's the uh, when you look at neutral helium coming in, there's two components. You know, it looks like there may well have been charge exchange. I guess between the neutral, between the ionized helium and neutral helium that lead for a slight change in velocity and a slight change in uh, direction to the neutral helium coming in. And you have maybe two components. But people have worked on this. Yeah. 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 So that's what, what we're working on here. It's not exactly at the heliopause, but in front of the heliopause where the plasma slows down. And then you get uh, charge exchange and get the slower component of the new. Yeah, sort of like the hydrogen wall, yeah. except in helium. Yeah. But the rest, that primary component, which is about uh, 96, 97% mm -hmm. of it, uh, that uh, comes in relatively, I would say, relatively unaffected. unaffected. But there is a slight effect from elastic collisions that mm -hmm. covers what's in that has been modeling recently yeah. and yes there is some slight modifications and with the fidelity of the data we have now we are getting that okay. but for helium 
the modifications are relatively small when it compared to hydrogen. That is correct. Yes. Hydrogen is a bigger factor. Thank you. You're welcome. It's what we would let's go in alphabetical order. So if now it's Jonathan Stanley, you can ask the question. Sorry. Yeah, you, you can ask your question now. Oh, okay. Um, so I was just going to sort of comment on both the um, dynamical equilibrium, which is to say the pressure balance, and yes. and the thermal balance, and um, so, of course, pressure balance is only mediated by, you know, waves, by sound waves. And so, you know, you can get, easily get substantial pressure imbalances for short periods of time. And especially if you have, you know, this dynamical situation, which you're showing on this plot, um, I think it's completely reasonable to expect that there will be pressure imbalances between clouds and between the surrounding medium and the clouds. As well, so um, on short time scales. Yeah, but short is not you know <laughs> very short. It you know it takes quite a while for these waves to propagate, right? Well, we do know that there are outflows at the uh, galactic poles. Yeah, well, and you know, so I've done um, uh, numerical MHD calculations of the uh, local interstellar medium and. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of pressure imbalances that persist for quite a long time. Um, anyway, also about thermal balance, that's another thing where, you know, it, it takes, you know, there are significant time scales involved in, you know, reaching thermal equilibrium. And the thing is that the time scales get longer the closer you get to the equilibrium um, because your disequilibrium is smaller. So, you know, you, you don't, you never really reach exactly at equilibrium. You kind of, float around it. Um, yeah, but, uh, okay, quite a question. Is the cooling by adiabatic expansion or is it primarily by collisional processes? Um, I've seen both because uh, there's because the, the medium surrounding it. So we have no idea how fast the hot gas in the local bubble is moving. There's no way to measure that. Um, but you would expect, I mean, you know, a sound wave in the local in, in hot gas can be 100 kilometers per second, right? Yes, yes. And so, you know, there's all these, in my models, there's lots of flows around these clouds and, um, you know, you, you can't get the, those speeds inside the clouds because they, you know, but- um, They're highly supersonic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, so they get trans, they, but they transmit weak sound waves into the clouds, which then move through the clouds over time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. Sorry, what was it you said you were you asked? Uh, anyway, that, that's that's my comment. Is that, you know you know I, I think that we you know we should expect there to be disequilibrium at least at a, you know a, a moderate level in both pressure and thermal um, balance. So. Um, uh, you know, I think it's very interesting because then, you know, we can find out interesting things about what's driving the thermal balance also if we, you know, if we possibly by uh, looking at this data. And, okay. and, but uh, I, I don't think thermal balance is the issue. I think it's the total pressure balance that's important. And thermal pressure is often a minor component, except for many degree gas. Right, right. <clears throat> And you know, we don't really know the strength of the magnetic field in much of the these clouds. You're right. I think we should move to the next question. So, okay, there are other people uh, that have asked questions. Uh, so, the next people will, the next person will, let's say Nikolai, not after the call, order the letter. So, Nikolai, you can ask your question. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, if you look indeed into different directions, not only just straight upstream, uh, then uh, the effect of the heliosphere can extend to much larger distances uh, than you would expect as easily to five, 10,000 uh, astronomical units. And uh, also uh, 
uh, the helium which is measured uh, by Ibex, for example, or Ulysses, it's already comes deflected. And uh, even the temperature probably uh, different uh, from what is uh, in the uh, pristine interstellar medium, supposedly. So, uh, so there are uh, internal factors, what I wanted to say, and probably external as well. And they should be uh, compared to each other. Okay. But I think this raises uh, an important issue, namely, we need to have a spacecraft that goes out into the pristine interstellar media. And uh, there is one that's being discussed, not approved, of course, yet, and that's interstellar probe. But the, the time scale for getting data when an interstellar probe is out beyond, say, the bow shot or whatever, um, is uh, you know, 50 years, 70 years, 90 years. Yeah, be patient. No, no, even if we assume that we know uh, that what is measured is already different. That's right. Uh, the question is what years. really is, what are the properties of the pristine in this colony? Yeah, I mean pristine, that he, helium which didn't experience charge exchange and un, unimpeded penetrated into the heliosphere and uh, uh, hit uh, uh, Ibex or Ulysses detectors, it's already modified. It's not pristine. It's modified because part of it, of the initial distribution function was removed in the uh, helium wall. Yeah, or the helium wall, yes. Yeah. yeah. You're right. And and so I yeah. So in other words, you have a, a, a reservoir of particles uh, in a supposedly Maxwellian equilibrium, but as the helium uh, atoms, but as they penetrate into the heliosphere, part of them are removed by charge exchange. As a result, what remains is not already Maxwellian and its properties change. But what if the helium, neutral helium, has a superthermal tail, okay, higher energy? That will not be modified by the helium wall, and that should be measurable. Yeah. So, so I think it'd be really, really interesting if we could measure uh, a super superthermal component of the inflowing Neutral helium. Yeah, hopefully with IMAP. Without, you think IMAP will do it? Well, I, I think we will be better equipped because right. we, we will not just concentrate on two months of the year. So we will scope out the distribution function. Yeah, this way. I think that'd be really interesting because you have no idea what the super thermal component of the maximum. Superposed on the Maxwellian distribution is in the pristine interstellar media. We don't know. It may have a significant pressure component. Okay, so now let's move to Federico question. Hi. Yeah, so I have a couple of questions. So the first one is about the cloud, uh, the colliding clouds. So uh, if so I, I did a very quick estimate. The mean free path of uh, neutral neutral collisions, if the density is 0.1 and the temperature is about 7,500 or so, should be of the order of 100 or 200 astronomical units. Is that right? So why should we expect that the density should be twice the density of the clouds? Because we will have collisions and uh, overpressure, and that will overall prevent the density to become just twice the density like in you know regular atmospheric cloud collisions okay you don't have just the... some of the densities but this is probably true within the uh, uh within a layer of uh, of the order of a few mean three paths or so or if the collision is very strong or like supersonic it creates a kind of shocks so stuff like that so my question was what thermodynamic process was investigated to assume that the density should be twice in addition to of course the uh, new horizon uh, 
uh, data analysis. Okay. The answer is no thermodynamic process was investigated to my knowledge, but mm. the problem basically did is say that the two clouds are overlapping, therefore the density is twice that of the individual clouds. Yeah, so it's if it is so, it's it's probably a, a transient state. It would right. be interesting to investigate. Yeah, the question that, is, what is the time? transient? Yes. So, what is the time scale? Would be interesting to investigate the relaxation time of this process, because overall, then the, the, it will create an overpressure, and then it will uh, become again 0.1 per centimeter cube, probably. Okay, well, let's work for the future. Right, no, I think that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. just time, say how thick is that in the lecture? Yeah, layer? Um, yeah it's interesting. How can that be maintained? And I, I and, think and that's related, where, to, related to the mean free path. Yeah, where I would uh, hope to get some answers or suggestions where to look from modeling such an interaction. So that would be really great. And then say, okay, then it should look like that. Can we see that in the IBEX data or later in the IMAP data? And, uh, and then see which processes are important and which are not. And the second was just a comment about the superthermal tails of helium. I think that I, it's probably difficult to uh, uh, investigate or to detect the superthermal uh, of the pristine interstellar medium because in the outer heliosheath, some high tails are created. The, the you know the warm breeze part of the distribution may may hide part of the uh, superthermal tail that might be present at infinity. But yeah, that was just a, a comment because the temperature in front of the of the heliopause is is probably high higher much higher than at infinity like about thirty thousand Kelvin or fifty thousand Kelvin. So when the change of core, it creates helium with that temperature or even higher. Yeah. All right. Uh, now let's move to final person. Uh, so Ali, now you can ask your question. Hi. Um, I guess my, my question is about um, if, our, if there are any proposed mechanisms for the creation of one of the clouds or some of the clouds or all of the clouds, rather uh, as a, you know, other than just the general understanding that there is leftover inter, you know, material from dying stars and so on. Like, okay. like, is there like one that we can know, hey, this cloud came from some remnant and we know where that remnant came from, or some nebula, and we know where that came from, or something like that. Okay, I'm no expert on that topic, so I can't really give you anything definitive to try to answer the question. My guess is what's really important is shock waves produced by the recent supernovae, which um, the most recent one was about two or two and a half million years ago, as determined from Iron 60. Um, which is radioactive elements, we can get a time scale from that. Okay, and you know, a supernova produces shocks, blast waves that over time relax, become more snow cloud type um, uh, phenomena expansion. And uh, you know, and if you have a snow cloud type wave and you introduce some kind of instability like Ray Taylor, um, then you have the possibility of all kinds of. Um, formation of cloud-like structures. Um, what's interesting is that a number of the clouds that we've observed look very filamentary, you know, long, thin type structures. And um, other clouds, you know, sort of look more like spherical, but if you look, consider a long, thin structure and observe it in a certain way, uh, from a certain direction, it looks more spherical than uh, filamentary. So it may well be that many of these clouds are, have a filamentary structure to them, which really suggests some kind of instability uh, produced from these uh, expansions from the supernova. But that's hardly a, um, shall we say, a definitive answer. And I really would defer to people who are more experts in such matters. Can I comment for a minute? Yeah. 
Yeah, Trump, Trump. <laughs> big week, but we yeah. I mean, we don't have any question after that. Okay, I just want just wanted to say that um, so my uh, picture of of how the clouds were created was they were pre-existing as denser clouds in a in a relatively low low you know sort of inner cloud medium density, which is like the local interstellar cloud density, which is like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 per cubic centimeter, and a shock overtook these denser clouds and swept past it. So that's how they got inside the bubble. And then over time, um, sort of the outer portions of the clouds get kind of ripped away by subsequent you know, explosions or, or shocks and form these lower density clouds. So. I would like to see your paper that develops that idea in detail. Yes, I will. Uh, it's in it's in preparation. Okay, good. Right. Let's we'll we'll see. Let's we'll we'll again. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So thanks everyone for coming. Next week we'll have another hybrid meeting. This time it will be in Rome. We'll be talking about solar and energetic particles. Uh, so you'll have all the information in the coming days. Uh, have a nice week and see you all next week. Bye. Okay.